on this Tuesday night, standing firm on staying put. And this is everything for us, right? The British Columbians refusing to leave their homes as a nearby wildfire rapidly swells. Chinese. Troubling trend. It's not right. Canada's rise in hate crimes reported to police. An American delegation defying Beijing, the uproar and anxiety over the U.S. House Speaker's visit to Taiwan. Plus, hitting the wrong notes. It's almost as if Ticketmaster and Live Nation are the scalpers. The ticket pricing strategy causing confusion and controversy for concert goers. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Farah Nasser. Good evening and thank you for joining us. We begin tonight with the wildfire fight in BC's interior, where hundreds of properties in the southern Okanagan have been evacuated and more residents have been put on notice to leave at a moment's notice. The Karameas Creek wildfire has exploded in size, fueled by days of extreme heat and fanned by fierce winds. The wildfire is burning near Penticton and has grown to about 2,800 hectares since it was first spotted on Friday. Not only has the wildfire now forced the closure of a busy highway, as Nito Garcia reports, the fire danger across the province remains extreme. A much quieter and cooler wildfire season compared to recent years came to a roaring halt in the last week. When amid tinder dry conditions and consistent heat, the Karameas Creek wildfire broke out, growing exponentially, spreading smoke, along with a familiar sense of uncertainty for hundreds of people in BC's southern Okanagan Valley, like these Twin Lakes residents, among those on evacuation alert. In the last five years, I've noticed a lot more. Yeah, never used to be this smoky, but it is every year we're dealing with a lot of smoke and a lot of fires. And it's moved a lot closer from what we saw, but to the highway anyways. And that's why hundreds more have been evacuated, including some in the province's largest First Nation reserve, along with the entire Apex Mountain Ski Resort, where staff turned pointed snow guns at the approaching fire. Just getting the things we love packed away <laughs> that you can't replace. And now it's, um, gee, I wasn't even, I didn't think this was gonna happen. But Sean Carter of Cedar Creek Ranch says leaving isn't an option. If you can't just leave, I mean, as you can see right here, we have 10 or eight yearling bulls right here, right? So I mean, you can't just all leave. Yeah, well, we got like almost 200 head of cattle. We got lots of bulls. We got at least 10 horses, like a lot, a lot of equipment, expensive equipment. These longtime ranchers say they've moved their animals to higher ground, but their home and livelihood is in the valley. We lose everything. Like this is our like income this is everything for us right this is our home if we lost this we don't know what we would do right and what the fire will do is also a big question with both rain and lightning in the forecast and no shortage of fuel we're dealing with uh, ponderosa pine and uh, you know fire just likes to move through these areas it's pretty open timber as well um so i think that's what we're seeing in terms of the growth we're probably not rebuilding this this is in this is i mean Probably 100 years in making this ranch or even more. So like we're, we're not rebuilding it. Hoping the wildfire season ends much quicker than it came. Nitu Garcha, Global News. And parts of central Alberta were hammered with huge hailstones on Monday afternoon. This video posted to social media shows the moment the severe storm hit near Innisfail and Markerville, southwest of Red Deer, with large hail that shattered car windows. Environment Canada says it's still investigating. To breaking news now, a Canadian Forces snowboard aircraft has crashed into a field in northern British Columbia. The Armed Forces say the plane went down while trying to take off from North Peace Regional Airport in Fort St. John, where the group was performing for the local air show over the weekend. Thankfully, the pilot is okay and didn't suffer any injuries. Officials are still looking into the cause. The team is scheduled to perform in Penticton, B.C. tomorrow. New numbers from Statistics Canada reinforce what we've been hearing from police and ethnic and religious and LGBTQ communities all across Canada. Hate crimes are on the rise. The numbers show reports of such attacks have risen 72% since the start of the pandemic. And as Sean O'Shea reports, religious minorities are bearing the brunt of the hate. Toronto's Chinatown, bustling any day of the week, where many in the Asian community have experienced discrimination or have seen others become targets of hate. 
Dennis Chow has lived here for 40 years. It's not right, you know, just uh, trying to uh, pick somebody, just pick a different race, a different uh, culture, or stuff like that, it's not right. This foreign student says she experienced racism from a bus driver. Her actions, like, uh, really made me uncomfortable. And when it comes to hate-motivated crimes, Statistics Canada says those continue to grow. The number of cases were up 27% from 2020 to 2021, but from 2019 to now, they're up 72%. All Canadians should be shocked when they take note of this report. Religious minorities are in the crosshairs for hate-based crime. The Jewish community is 1.25% of the Canadian population. And in 2021, it represented 56% of all hate crimes targeting religious minorities. Anti-Catholic hate was up in the last year. So were attacks on Muslims. The most shocking in public in June of last year, when four members of a family were struck down and killed by a driver who faces first-degree murder and terrorism charges. Whether it's online or in person, hate doesn't always show up in statistics. 80% of hate crimes and hate incidences are not reported to the police. That's what Statistics Canada says. We are seen as foreigners. Forever we are told to go back to a country that we may not have any association with. That kind of trauma will never show in numbers. Community advocates say government policies need to change more, and so do attitudes. People are, are hungry and willing uh, and compassionate enough to be able to expect uh, better for their neighbours who have suffered such. We need to look deeper. We also need to look at the systemic impact and the generational impact of hate and discrimination. One challenge in black and indigenous communities can be persuading victims to come forward because trust in the system and police is often missing. Sean O'Shea, Global News, Toronto. And that same report has found the rate of sexual assaults reported to police has climbed to the highest level since 1996. StatsCan says there were more than 34,000 reports of sexual assault countrywide in 2021. That's an increase of 18 percent from 2020. And just like hate crimes, StatsCan and police say sexual attacks are significantly underreported as many victims choose not to contact police. It's been two months since news broke of a lawsuit quietly settled by Hockey Canada involving sexual assault allegations against eight members of its 2018 World Juniors team. Now, the young woman at the center of this story says she desperately wants to correct the record that she did go to police. So much so, she's taken a polygraph test to prove it. Abigail Beeman reports. Desperate to clear her name, the woman identified in court filings as EM took a lie detector test. In a statement, her lawyer says it found her to be truthful. He's passed it along to London Police, Hockey Canada and the NHL. Polygraph results aren't admissible in Canadian court. Hockey Canada had stated the woman did not cooperate with authorities. Her lawyer says they're trying to correct the record and she made it clear to London police as early as June 24, 2018 that she wanted criminal charges pursued. Hockey Canada since reversed its comments and in a statement to Global News apologized for the information first provided. It's another layer of problem for Hockey Canada if it turns out that she was participating in an investigation or cooperating with the police. Hockey Canada doesn't come out of this looking good either way. EM declined an interview request. Her statement asks for privacy. There is a code of silence. There is a culture that, that, that we have created. And I think most of us, most of us can't handle the truth that's out there that's really going on in our sports world. And I think Brenda Andress is a former commissioner of the Canadian Women's Hockey League, massively disappointed by Hockey Canada, especially to learn some of her league's registration fees went to a legal fund. The National Equity Fund paid out $7.6 million in settlements, mostly related to the abuse caused by former coach Graham James. When we asked for money, we were told no, there wasn't any. And then to find out that some of our registration fees went to some of these kind of, you know, uh, individuals to settle something, it's like, whoa, that's a double hit. London police have reopened their investigation into what happened in 2018, along with Hockey Canada. And there's a new one. The International Ice Hockey Federation has launched an inquiry to get more information. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. 
a diplomatic trip called dangerous. Coming up, China's anger over the U.S. House Speaker's visit to Taiwan. Military personnel are on high alert in the Pacific, as one of the United States' highest-ranking officials makes a heavily criticized visit to Taiwan, a self-ruled island claimed by China as its own. U.S. Speaker Nancy Pelosi says her unscheduled stop is more important now than ever. But it went ahead despite objections from China and U.S. President Joe Biden, sparking concern over potential retaliation by Beijing. Reggie Cicchini reports. It was this very moment that Chinese officials argued America was playing with fire. U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, second in line to the presidency after the vice president, paying a visit to an island ally under the grip of a fervent foe. Saying in a tweet, the trip honors America's unwavering commitment to supporting Taiwan's vibrant democracy. After days of traveling through Asia, her visit was rumored, though details were never released. I don't ever talk about my travel because, as some of you know, it's a security issue. And while the White House and Pentagon opposed the trip, both chose to not stand in the way. Would Beijing have likely spun a canceled trip to portray the U.S. in a more weak spotlight, at least internally throughout China? Obviously, Xi Jinping would be able to wave this as a victory um, domestically in China, saying that uh, his hardened stance and uncompromising position have led the United States to blink first. This isn't the first speaker to walk on Taiwanese soil. Republican Newt Gingrich flew in in 1997. 25 years later, China is more powerful and antagonistic. It's foreign spokesperson calling this trip a gross interference in internal affairs. The United States will not and does not, will not seek and does not want a crisis. We are prepared to manage what Beijing chooses to do. How China responds is a matter of speculation. Military drills are anticipated, along with the threat of cyber attacks. Taiwan's official website for its president went down early Tuesday, though it's unclear who was behind it. These are some of the ways that they will be doing um, to express uh, their displeasure, uh, opposition uh, towards this type of you know interaction between the United States uh, and Taiwan. Outside of the political bluster, a genuine and heartfelt welcome from the ground. The nation's tallest tower embracing Pelosi's visit, even at risk of enraging its neighbor, highlighting strength in Taiwan's fragile democracy, even under the shadow of a communist giant. Reggie Chikini, Global News, Washington. Afghanistan's Taliban government is criticizing a U.S. operation that killed al-Qaeda leader Ayman al-Zawahiri, one of the key masterminds behind the September 11th attacks. As Redmond Shannon reports, the 71-year-old died on his balcony in an early morning drone strike in Kabul, one similar to those that have resulted in civilian deaths in the past. This is the balcony where it's believed Ayman al-Zawahiri was killed early Sunday morning. According to a senior U.S. administration official, the al-Qaeda leader and his family had been living in central Kabul for months. They said no one else died when a drone similar to this fired two missiles at the building. These operations are not always so accurate. Last August, a U.S. drone strike in Kabul killed 10 innocent adults and children just days before the U.S. withdrawal. The Taliban condemned Sunday's attack, but without mentioning al-Zawahri's name. He was a global uh, jihadist or terrorist, and uh, the idea that he would be given sanctuary inside of Kabul is remarkable. I suppose he miscalculated about our willingness to strike inside of Afghanistan. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says the presence of the al-Qaeda leader in Afghanistan was a gross violation of the 2020 peace deal between Washington and the Taliban. Although the airstrike itself arguably violates the deal too. If you are a threat to our people, the United States will find you and take you out. Al-Zawahri took over as leader of al-Qaeda in 2011 after the U.S. killing of Osama bin Laden. The two men planned the September 11th attacks together. Al-Zawahri's video messages sometimes encouraged attacks on the West. He's also believed to be behind the 1998 U.S. embassy bombings in East Africa and the deadly attack on the USS Cole. 
The future of the disparate groups under the Al-Qaeda banner is unclear, but this killing will probably make life more difficult for the Taliban and Afghans. The international community has frozen billions of dollars of its foreign reserves as it demands better human rights in the country. Meanwhile, the United Nations says almost half of Afghanistan's population faces acute hunger. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Bringing the big guns ahead, the Canadian weapons helping Ukraine's forces hold the line. Ukraine's military leaders say long-range weapons are key in their efforts to push back Russian forces and hold their eastern territory. Now, one of those weapon systems making a difference in the war? M777 howitzers. And they're donated by Canada. Europe Bureau Chief Crystal Gamansing was granted access to a secret location near the front lines to meet up with troops using the sophisticated heavy weapons. Tucked expertly into the bushes, out of view from Russian aerial surveillance, a small group of artillerists wait for the order to unmask their secret weapon. Scattered around their very small camp, concealed piles of high-precision munitions. The intensity of fighting work is very high. More than 100 shots are fired out from the position at the enemy per day. Andriy, the deputy commander of the battalion, races towards one of his M777 howitzer locations in the southern Kharkiv region with Global News, the only Canadian network granted such access. To protect the security of the site and the soldiers, Global is using a sweeping geographical location and agreed to limit the visuals of the M777. There are a few of these sophisticated weapons in the area provided by Canada, the U.S. and Australia. There are also decoys. The battery commander says they've been able to destroy Russian munition stockpiles, weapons and provide cover for their frontline soldiers taking fire or needing to reposition. Long-range weapons are vital for Ukraine as Russian troops try to push forward and snatch more territory in the east. They're working as fast as they can to reload this M777. Right now, these ones can fire up to 28 kilometers away. It is in support of the men on the front lines around the Donbass. After firing several rounds, the M777 is quickly concealed and the wait begins to see if the cannon has exposed the battery's position and fire returned. This time, no response from Russia. The artillerists have gotten very good at deploying the weapon. We were essentially the first one to receive them. Yevhen, the battery commander, traveled to Germany to be trained on the lightweight Tolvo weapon, returned and trained others. Canada donated an undisclosed number of M777s to Ukraine and nearly $100 million worth of rounds, including fuses and charge bags. But the wish is for HIMARS, the truck-mounted rocket launchers that can move quickly. HIMARS is certainly better. It is reactive. It fires more shots at the time as in a single howitzer. According to Deputy Commander Andri, long-range weapon systems are key. He says artillery is saving the blood of the infantry. We need them to save troops. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, in southern Kharkiv region. Next, the jaw-dropping concert prices costing Springsteen fans an arm and a leg to dance in the dark. Rock icon Bruce Springsteen definitely isn't feeling the love over money. The legendary performer is now facing backlash after the price for his concert tickets skyrocketed way beyond the reach of many diehard fans. By how much, you ask? Try several thousand dollars. As Ross Lord reports, the controversy stems from a new business model that was, of course, born in the USA. When it comes to live performers, Bruce Springsteen is a living legend. More than five decades after he and his E Street Band started playing shows, Springsteen's fans have never felt cheated. Until now. Some tickets for Springsteen's 2023 U.S. tour cost between four dollars and $5,000 apiece. 
setting off an online storm of outrage and forcing diehard fans to reevaluate their dedication. These ticket prices are obscene and insane for any artist. <laughs> Springsteen can on that. Ticketmaster calls this scheme dynamic pricing, a system already used by airlines and ride-sharing services. Dynamic pricing uses computer algorithms to constantly change prices according to market demand. It's aimed at cutting out resellers, so more money goes to the artist and the promoter. It's almost as if Ticketmaster and Live Nation are the scalpers at this point. They, tried to, they, they say they wanted to eliminate it, but they became the scalpers. This music writer says he understands the intent behind dynamic pricing, but he thinks it's risky. The problem with dynamic pricing in a situation where the demand is extraordinarily high is that you are going to lock out a lot of fans. Some fans and politicians are calling for legislation to limit what they see as price gouging. Springsteen has not commented his manager suggests it's no different than what performers like Taylor Swift have already done. Since the uproar started, prices seem to have come down somewhat. But some tickets are still listed for well over $1,000 a piece. The boss's international tour does not include Canada, just as well possibly for fans who are reconsidering the value of seeing him in concert. Lord, Global News. The irony is that it's Bruce Springsteen at the center of all this. Now that's Global National for this Tuesday night. I'm Farah Nasser, and on behalf of our whole crew, I want to thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. Tonight's Your Canada is the Northern Lights over the resort village of Candle Lake, Saskatchewan. We love seeing your Canada, so please email us your photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Until tomorrow, take care of yourselves and each other. Good night.